Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe, hit the red button. And if you are listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Garrett Smith. About a year ago, I sat with him and we talked about the dangers of excess vitamin A. I will link to the two part episode in the show notes, but you want to check that out. We go into all the different studies that talks about all the different types of vitamin A, not just in supplements, but also in meats and in carrots and the carotenoids and all of the good retinol, et cetera, of vitamin A and how it can become toxic within our body. Dr. Garrett Smith is a licensed naturopathic medical doctor in Arizona. He has a Bachelor of Science in Physiology and a minor in Nutrition. He's also certified as a Strength and Conditioning Specialist. Today we talk a little bit more about some vitamin A stuff. We talk about cod liver oil, but we also talk a lot about copper and how there's a group of people that are really for copper, but how it can actually be toxic for our bodies. I know there's people that always message me and that ask about if bioavailable copper is good for us. And so we get into a lot of that nuance. We also talk a lot about liver health and bile acids and what that all means for a carnivore diet and without fiber. And there are points that we disagree, but we have mutual respect for each other that at the end of the day, we are just trying to help our clients and patients. And if the way that you are eating is helping you heal and long term and that your markers look good long term, then it doesn't really matter what we're saying, whether we agree that some beans or some fiber needs to be incorporated, or if it's a high fat version of carnivore, you need to find what works for you. And we talk about the differing opinions, as well as a lot of the science that goes behind cholestasis, liver health and vitamin A and copper. We also talk a lot about testosterone and how vitamin A can actually impact your abilities to one even have higher testosterone, but it can also impact your abilities to have sexual intercourse. These things are really important as we talk about fertility and having future offspring. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Smith. I'm so excited to have you back on my channel. I know that uh, the last time we had you on, so many people really enjoyed your comprehensive breakdown about vitamin A, and I will link to that in the show notes. But for the people that are brand new to you, if you can introduce yourself. Oh, gosh. Well, hello. Thank you for having me on again, Judy. Um, oh, who am I? Well, I'm a, I'm a licensed naturopathic physician in the state of Arizona. And I do what, what I call, what is called clinical nutrition, which is the treatment, specific treatment of disease through nutrition, whether it's, I do hair and blood testing to analyze what people need. We get some idea of toxicity there. And then I do, I have my own little program where I'm telling people which toxins and other things to avoid and how to help their body get rid of stored toxins out of their liver. And I've been in practice since 2006. I was a personal trainer for about 12 years before that. And yeah, I got a couple kids here and just doing, we're having a good time. I started some, started uh, my own line of supplements that I've been, that I've been working on. We have some fun stuff coming up there. Very unique. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk too much about myself, but yeah. Out of curiosity, when you do the blood work and the hair mineral, do you, so since I do work with both as well, mm-hmm. do you notice that one is more telling than the other or do you just use both together? I look at, I, I actually, I kind of use an analogy for this in terms of mm-hmm. if, if you're trying to, you know, put a screw in, you want a mm-hmm. screwdriver and not a hammer. So like you want to use the right tool for the right job. And one of the biggest mistakes that I think both sides make that do either blood or hair is they've decided that that tool is the best tool for every job. Oh yeah. And they're kind of, they kind of, you know, a conventional medicine just throws hair analysis out the window immediately. And then, you know, uh, the hair analysis, people throw blood tests out the window immediately. And I go, what if like, as an example, zinc and copper show up better on blood tests because they do I I I absolutely think I, I went over this in one of my live streams where I was showing how, on a hair test, sometimes like the copper was off the charts, but on the blood test, it was low. And then I had other patients who were showing low on the hair and 
way high on the blood. And I was going, so if, if somebody only did one of these, this person is copper toxic. If you're copper toxic in the hair or you're copper toxic in the blood, you're copper toxic. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. But you could miss it if you only did one. And so it's really, really important in my opinion to do both. I mean, the biggest thing for, to do both on them is zinc and copper in my opinion. And you know, ferritin, you can have people who show up with a low iron on a hair test. And I've had a guy who had like a, an iron on a hair test on a trace elements test of 0.5, which is most people might think it's low. I'm fine with it. I actually mm -hmm. like it there, but his ferritin was 500 something. Wow. Which is really high. So right. it's just, you cannot relying on one tool because that's what you were taught is very limiting. And when we are trying to get a view of what is kind of going on inside the liver, especially where the liver can store so many of these things, taking as many angles as possible is, is really helpful. So we can just, I've kind of looked and I've kind of decided which, which minerals are valuable on each one. Mm -hmm. And then we have to talk to people about like, you don't take your zinc the day of, or the day before your labs, because if you take it even the day before your zinc's going to be falsely elevated and it's going to look too high. And we're going to overestimate the level of your zinc deficiency. So it's just kind of like looking at the different tools and wh why, why limit ourselves in the tools when we don't have to, when we could do both. I mean, I can do both. A lot of people can't do the hair analysis. People often don't want to do bloods because they simply can't run them. So they just kind of go, sure. well, bloods are unnecessary and they only show a snapshot and they, and you know, and I go, well, that's just kind of your, your bias. Cause you can't run them. <laughs> it, let's say what a client or a patient of yours was only able to, because of purely financial reasons, if they could only run one is, do you have a favorite? I know it doesn't sound like you do. No, but... I do hair. If I could only do one, I, I was, I was, I came up in this game doing hair analysis in terms of the mineral and the nutrition stuff. Yeah. Hair, I can, I can deal with not having bloods, but in terms of zinc and copper, I re which is a huge part. I really like to have it, but I can, I can get away with just the hair. So interesting. Yeah. And we'll talk more about copper in a second. I really want to talk about liver health and liver function. Um, you know, there, you talk a lot about liver and bile imbalances and um, it causing a lot of the problems in our health. We think of really just when it comes to liver health, it's either that we have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or fatty liver disease and because of carbs or alcohol and that's it. But there's a lot more to liver health like cholestasis, cirrhosis. Um, if you could talk a little bit about liver function and health and um, how I guess the foods we consume or the supplements we take, the excess vitamin we possibly like vitamin A that we consume, how this all affects our overall health and function. Just a little question there. Just a, just a I know, such one. a small one. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm, I'm going to kind of try to take it back to the basics of how I, how I look at it. So I, I got into the work of Anthony Mawson. Anthony Mawson okay. is a, um, he's a great epidemiologist and he started looking into vitamin A toxicity as causing disease, like back in the 1980s. Like I think his first paper or published paper was 1984. So he is way out ahead of everybody else. And what he was, what his proposed mechanism was, was that all these things that can cause liver, it's called liver injury. So liver injury okay. is another name for cholestasis. Cholestasis is the fancy term for basically bile leaking out from multiple places, which we'll go over, but it's leaking out into the bloodstream. Okay. Bile is by definition, the most toxic fluid in our entire body. This is the nature of it. If you think of like, people will say the, the, the liver processes stuff and all that stuff. But even if you had a suit, I, I look at the liver in three ways. It is a filter. Anyone who says that the liver is not a filter doesn't understand the function of, of what a filter means. A filter means simply to take something out of something else. By definition, the liver does that. So it is a filter. And then we get into um, the, the sewage, what I call like the sewage processing plant idea, where it's biotransforming, doing biotransformation, or sometimes we call it intoxication with various compounds. So it's turning one compound into different compounds. This is not always a 
nice and neat and safe and healthy thing. As an example, ethanol, alcohol. As ethanol goes through the process, the second step is acetaldehyde. So when people think of hangovers or they think of alcohol poisoning, or they think of the damage that alcohol causes to people over time, it is the acetaldehyde. It's actually what we turn alcohol into before we turn it into acetic mm -hmm. acid. That's what could kill you. That's what makes you feel terrible the next day. So actually the intoxication right. of the biotransformation, even though we're trying to get rid of it, can actually make things more toxic. Um, in, in the vitamin A pathway, it goes from retinol, an alcohol, to retinaldehyde, an aldehyde, vitamin A, and then it goes to retinoic acid, which is related the exact same chemicals as Accutane, isotretinoin, Atra, all trans retinoic acid, Retin-A, and um, third, or sorry, nine cis retinoic acid, which is allytretinoin, which is used as a chemotherapy. So your body is basically making these really known toxic drugs out of vitamin A, and it's it's the process of intoxication or biotransformation. So that's mm -hmm. the sewage treatment plant, and then there is the storage. The liver, I can't believe that I see people on the internet actually saying that the liver doesn't store things. And I'm like, this is not hard to find in the research. Like the liver stores toxic metals, basically the definition of storage. They'll say, well, it doesn't store things. And I go, storage means you have more of something in one area than another, right? So then you'll have people say, well, the liver is full of vitamin A and copper and B12. And I'm like, that's the definition of storage. <laughs> so there's a lot of weird, like, and I know I'm in an, I'm in the naturopathic field. So there's a lot of pseudoscience, like not backed in the real science stuff that's out there in both modern medicine and conventional medicine. And to say the liver doesn't store things, but yet saying that liver's a nutrient dense food is like, that doesn't make any sense. So, so we've got a filter, we've got a, a trans, a sewage processing plant because it's trying to get rid of those poisons. That's what a sewage processing plant does. Right. And then yes. a storage area, the bile is supposed to go into what I call the bile pathway. So from the liver to the bile, there's the little bile ducts inside the liver. There's the big bile ducts outside the liver that connects to your gallbladder that connects to your pancreas that connects to your intestines. And then you want that bile to go down and go the right way, not back into your stomach. That's acid reflux. That's GERD. That's nausea. That's, that's vomiting bile. You want it to go down and then go out in your poop. So it's normal for us to get rid of about 5% of the bile a day. That's it. The other 95% gets reabsorbed by your intestines and goes right back to your liver. So then your liver can filter it out again and it can go through this whole dance again. It's supposed to be like a circle, the enterohepatic circulation. What does toxic bile contain? Well, it contains things like retinoic acid and retinoic acid, that form of vitamin A. It's also used on people's face as called a yellow peel to basically melt the upper layers of cells on their face. Our skin and our gut lining are not very picky as to what they absorb, right? Or else people okay. go, well, why would we absorb this through our skin? Like with, with honestly with women and a lot of their cosmetics and they're just putting straight poisons on their skin. And they're wondering why their health is so bad. And I'm like, you absorb, I mean, I, I tell people when we're doing, trying to fix their magnesium levels, like I believe that topical magnesium, transdermal magnesium is 10 times as effective in raising magnesium levels than pills. And I've seen it on hair tests. I can right. show it over and over. I can have people who insist on pills and I go, well, we'll look at the next test and we'll see how you do. And then we get it and it's like, nope, didn't work. Mm -hmm let's do topical. And then all of a sudden they're, if they do it right, their, their magnesium is way above their calcium and then they feel better. So the skin can absorb good things, right? But the skin also, as I don't know if you've seen those sunscreen studies where they, people put on sunscreen and then 24 hours later, they have all those sunscreen chemicals running around their blood. So sure. it would be wonderful if our skin and our gut were picky about what it absorbs. It's not. So if we're putting the wrong things in, whether on our skin or whether in our gut, we're going to reabsorb them. So are there, is there blood work that can measure how much bile acid may be in your body or in your blood? Yes. Um, actually on my, on my most recent, um, channel video, not my live stream, but the, the one I did recently, I went over my bloods and I did, so I know LabCorp has a serum bile acids test, which I believe 
the, when they start when you start talking about bile acids, they get into so many different glycodeoxycholic acid and toro. You know, they get into all these things. The serum bile acids test. So it sounds like serum bile acids. You're like, that's the, all the bile acids in the blood. That's what I thought when I first looked at it. I didn't look deeper. It's two different bile acids. Okay, whoop de doo Now, the reason why I say whoop de doo is because one paper I looked at said there are 55 different bile acids that have been discovered in human blood. Wow. We get to look at two there. And then there's another one called fractionated bile acids, which measures four other ones. And then you could, if somebody was really into it, they could get a, a urine bile acids test, urinary bile acids. And I don't remember, I didn't even look at that one because I wasn't interested in it. Um, but of course that's going to measure a couple of them. So a couple things about fatty liver is that fatty liver, if you go and you look up images on the internet, fatty liver, almost always, whether in pictures or, or you know, drawings or actual pictures is a yellowish color. It starts going from that, right. that maroon, that dark maroonish color of a healthy liver more towards a yellowish tinged maroonish color. Well, what things are we talking about here that are yellow? Well, vitamin A is a big yellow color. It's fat soluble and we have fatty liver and recent research has shown people in the past used to say, well, fatty liver is a vitamin A deficient condition because they're, they're analyzing the liver and it looks low in vitamin A. And then a recent study, a more recent study, I think it, I think it was 2010. They basically came out and they said, yeah, pretty much everybody before us was analyzing the liver wrong. And there's a ton of vitamin A in fatty liver and it turns yellow. That makes sense. Well, what is, what else is something that's yellow in the liver bile? Anybody who's ever vomited up bile knows what color and taste that is. Then many, many bitter poisons that people may eat or take are yellow in color. An example might be in the supplement world, berberine. Berberine's mm. very, very bitter. It's very, very yellow. And if you read certain research that I've posted around before, it's actually super duper toxic down to the DNA level and all of that mutagenic and all that. So, so. One question I have with the fatty liver is, so I know with alcohol that acetyl aldehyde or mm -hmm. um, that, that is super toxic. And so if you drink a lot of alcohol, I could see how that becomes that fatty liver disease. But what about the whole non-alcoholic fatty liver <laughs> disease with fructose and sugars supposedly? So what are your thoughts with that? There are three main things that they do in animal studies to create fatty liver. They don't do these all at the same time because if they did, oh gosh, those, okay. those mice are probably not making it. Um, they either do a low protein diet. I always joke, hello vegans, or they do a high fructose diet. I look at like fruitarians and people eating lots right. of sugar. Ray Peters. Hey, hi. Hi there. And then we go to high fat diets, which is probably the most common way that they induce liver injury, cholestasis fatty liver. And, and then everybody gets into, well, it's the type of fat. And I go, I don't think so. I, I just don't agree. So what, when we look at the American diet, the standard American diet, and we start going high fructose, high fat, low protein, right? You start going, Oh, Oh, then that's just macros right? That's just like right. a macro orientation. That's not even getting into the toxicity of like where Anthony Mawson has shown over and over and over that vitamin A causes liver injury. And we just talked about high vitamin A and fatty liver. And that's not even talking about glyphosate. That's not even talking about copper, which has been shown over and over. They used to actually know that when they had a shortage, there was a baby, um, for the, like the preemies and stuff, the, uh, the feeding tube stuff. They ran out of zinc. This was like early two thousands. I think they ran out of zinc to put in and all the babies were getting cholestasis because they didn't have enough zinc. As I was mentioning on my live stream today, China is said to have 50% of the soils in China are deficient in zinc. And then I kind of said, well, okay, so how much, how much of the information coming out of China do we actually believe is like totally true? So if it's, if they say it's 50%, is it 
80%? Is it 90%? Is it 100%? Because, right, they want to save face. They don't want to look so bad. Right. And I can tell you that on testing, in my opinion, the only people who ever from food alone come up zinc okay are pretty much all beef carnivore. Like not no organ meats, no nothing. Those are the only people who come up with enough zinc. I have people who are eating a pound to a pound and a half of beef a day. They don't pull it off. It's only the people who eat it all day long. But then I, I am those people who are coming to me eating an all muscle meat diet are coming to me for a reason. It hasn't fixed all of their stuff. Sure. So, or they even maybe some people I've seen get, get worse on that. Not, not, it's not suitable for everybody. Some people do great on it. Some people don't. I know I personally do better on more meat in my diet. You know, some people are like, oh, what's your blood type? I'm a type O. Yeah. So, okay. I just feel better on more meat than more plant foods, but that doesn't mean I'm on an all meat diet. Um, I've just looked at it and I've gone when in doubt, uh, this, this goes along with, with kind of my dietary approach. I generally tell people when in doubt, eat more protein. <laughs> It's very simple. If, if you're in doubt, eat more protein, whether that's whatever type of protein that is, get more of it because the low protein, they, they were, there were, there was a study where they were about to, to give, I think it was mice birth control to see the liver injury that happened. So ladies, if you don't know, liver injury, cholestasis, toxic bile in your blood is a very, 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 very well known side effect of birth control. So if your health problems started after birth control, so I have people who are, you know, it tends to happen more in women, but I have people just, I tell them a minimum of 50 grams, five, zero, not one, five, but 50 grams of total protein a day. And you would be amazed even in meat eating women, not carnivores most likely, but even in people eating a mixed diet and they're eating plenty of meat and they're not even at, you know, you have smaller women, let's say who don't eat a ton, they're not even to 50 grams of total protein a day. And then you think of wow. vegetarians and vegans. People have no idea how many beans it takes to get to 50 grams of protein from beans in a day. That's just obscene. And I do have people in the program who are eating like three cups of beans a day. Some of them do that. And they feel, when people feel good on beans, they know it. And when people don't feel good on beans, they know it. And what do I say to them? Right. Don't eat it if it doesn't feel good. Like, d just don't do that. It's very simple. Um, but yeah, so. A couple questions. Yes, go ahead. The When you said the 50 grams of protein, do you mean 50 grams of protein within a meat or the 50 no. grams of protein? Total from all sources. Okay. I just mean, okay. I, I'm just trying to hit that. That is like the basement level. That's actually. Okay. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of the World Health Organization, but. <laughs> I actually got this from them and they were talking about like starving third world countries. And they were mm -hmm. saying that adults need a minimum of 50 grams total protein a day to not get protein malnutrition. I feel that 50 grams is a little bit low, but. So, so you're dealing with a carnivore crowd. So getting protein True. numbers up with that crowd is, is very easy. Um, cause that's right, everything they're eating is basically protein. Right. So. Yeah. I just, I, I get people from all sorts of mixed diets. I, I had somebody okay. come to me. I get people in some of the worst shape. Like I had a guy mm -hmm. come to me. He's like, the only thing I tolerate is potatoes. Okay. So we work with that. I'm not going to force him to okay. eat stuff that he doesn't tolerate. That's fair. That's fair. You know, and he might not hit 50 grams of total protein a day, but the goal is to get to get him out of that. And we start to see the sensitivities go away. I had a woman come to me, one of her main foods that she tolerated, she only tolerated a couple of things, but one of the main foods she tolerated was mangoes. And she's coming to the vitamin A toxicity guy, right? And mangoes are like bright orange and it's, you know, right, right. other people on the network, not, not knowing what I did, they were saying, well, you got to get off the mangoes. You got to get off the mangoes. You got to get off the mangoes. That's going to keep you sick. And I was going, I kind of stepped in on the, on the network. It's kind of like a mini Facebook. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. We always have to remember this with really sick people who can't eat a lot of things. The number one thing that you could do that could kill you dead is to not eat enough is to starve yourself. Sure. So we're not going to starve somebody. And she's just been following the program. 
and I think she's off the mangoes now. She, she, we, as she, food allergies are completely linked to vitamin A intake. Absolutely. In childhood, I have multiple, multiple studies connecting multivitamins in kids and cod liver oil in kids and, you know, asthma and atopic dermatitis and all sorts of stuff. You can just look at the vitamin A intake in kids. When they give kids vitamin A, the more they get, the more allergic they get. So as we get this down in people, all of a sudden their food intolerances and their food sensitivities go away. I want to circle back to one of the things you said. So you said those three, uh, the rodent studies that there were three things. Mm -hmm. Um, One is the high fat is also what can worsen the fatty liver. Mm -hmm. So what I've noticed is on a higher fat, like a ketogenic carnivore version where maybe they're having a ribeye with one tablespoon of some type of fat. It could be butter. It could be something else. And I know you're not super high fat, but I think we should address it. No, no, yeah. And what, what I found though, is that as people don't eat a lot of the carbohydrates and they don't eat other things, um, a lot, their liver markers actually look really good. And some, there are some people you're right where they'll have loose stool. So maybe they're getting, because of the higher fat, they're knocking on bile acid store a little bit more. And so they're, you know, pooping everything out too quickly. But there's a good portion of the people I work with that when they get to a balance of 70% fat in terms of total calories, so again, a ribeye with maybe a tablespoon of fat for a meal, their overall, the inflammation in their liver looks pretty good. So how does the liver store toxins? It binds them to fatty acid esters, basically fats. Simplified ideas, it binds them to fatty acids, esters, and it stores them in the liver. Is it possible that a very high fat diet is simply helping people feel better and their numbers get better for a while because it's taking all the poisons out of their blood because of an excess of fats that are available to bind to it, shoving all of those in the liver And it's basically creating a slowly ticking time bomb until the liver is as full of fats and poisons as it can be while it looks great to people as they're going along. This is this. And I have people who said I did great on a high fat diet until the stuff hit the fan and I didn't know what was going on. And that's when I tell people like, yeah, if if we are band-aiding the whole situation and just shoving stuff into the liver, Because people on high fat diets, if they're not eating a lot of vitamin A, their vitamin A will go down drastically. Where did it go? We store vitamin A in the liver as, as retinyl ester. We bind fatty acids to it and we store it in the liver. Um, but the all muscle meat diet, actually, I just had a woman the other day who was having some digestive problems and not getting along with certain things. And I put her on basically a lean beef carnivore diet with warm water. And I'm like, we're just trying to calm things down. We're going to shut things down for a bit. And then we're going to bring We're going to, you're going to test out things and we're going to bring them back and we're going to see what you tolerate and what you don't. And we're going to figure it out from there. So, so I use this, I can use this as a, as a bridge. This was, this was a diet, uh, health diet back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I forget. Oh, Salisbury. It was a guy named Salisbury, which is funny, right? Salisbury steak. Um, But anyway, he had this diet and he was, he was helping people get better. Now, a all muscle meat diet is if people are eating good choice of meat, it is a low toxin diet. Absolutely. Totally. I am of the opinion that without some kind of soluble fiber or something to bind to the bile. So, I mean, the normal diet, normal, normal diet in the research, you get rid of 5% of your bile a day. Well, how much fiber you eat, soluble fiber specifically, because soluble fiber is what gels and that's what can grab onto stuff and has been shown to grab onto bile. It's been shown to grab onto vitamin A. Without any soluble fiber, I don't know how much bile, if the body gets rid of actually even less bile than it would if soluble fiber is present. I'd like to say several things. So one, um, I personally have been eating a higher fat version of carnivore and it has helped the steroid hormone. So in terms of eating foods with higher cholesterol levels, um, I was able to support my thyroid hormones, um, my sex hormones, and even my mental health. So I, I am actually an advocate of the higher Mm -hmm. fat 
And I, I understand that the logic is, well, a lot of the grass grazing animals happen to be leaner. And there's some truth to that. But then if you think about the entire animal, there is fat around the organs, and that's a yeah. protective fat. Yeah. Um, and people, if you eat the full animal, sands th- most of the organs, um, you will still be eating a good amount of fat. And so I've done blood work and I've done even blood work very recently and my inflammation is very low. My liver health looks good and I understand, but I've been doing it for over five or nearly five years. So it's not that I'm very new to this way of eating. And then I have several clients with the same situation. So they are healing. So I, maybe there are people that, as you say, the higher fat isn't ideal, But in terms of the fiber, I think that when you are consuming higher fat, you do uh, stimulate more bile production. And then some of that will help to whether you have loose stools or you have just consistent bowels. I mean, I am not a proponent of people saying in the carnivore space that you should go once a week and it's all good. I do not believe that. I think people should go at least once every day or once every other day. And most of my clients go that way. So I know that they are eliminating properly. And and then to use the logic of, well, most of the animals, even in the past were lean. Well, then the same goes with the fiber. I think all of a sudden we assume that we need so much fiber in our bodies to then pull and bind to other toxins, but that's a relatively new concept. And there's a lot of studies that show that too much fiber actually makes people not feel well. So but I think the lean protein or eating carnivore meat only with just lean protein, I've seen way too many people that cannot do it long term, because it's almost the rabbit starvation diet, you're eating so much protein without any fat as a energy substrate, and then not having really glucose as another energy source then using protein, which is not an ideal energy substrate, makes them feel horrible. And without that support for the whole cholesterol and the steroid pathways for fat, um, it's a disastrous way to eat long term. And maybe you don't do that long term. And maybe that's why you add the beans and the rice. And that makes sense, because then you're giving that carbohydrate substrate. But I've just been in practice long enough. And I've seen enough people really heal with a higher fat diet, it may not be everyone and I get that. But um, especially women that have been under eating, uh, very malnourished, uh, there's a lot of healing. And I'm not just talking about six months, one year, I'm talking about years of being in this way of eating. Yeah, yeah. I well, I tend to my long term is like 10 years. That's where I get into like, I I tell people come back in 10 years. And if if everything's still great, then great, then it's, it's working. If we get to, I'll let you know, (laughs) depending upon how toxic the liver was, you have, you start with either more space or less space to store. I'm like water, right? I can, I can, whatever somebody knows works for them. I'm like, okay, let's make sure like with the the more vegan thing, I'm like, you got to make sure you get enough protein. We got to make sure you get enough zinc. Maybe we add taurine. You might need some B12, but maybe not. And then like with the, the carnivore types, I'm like, I think you'll do better. Even if we get some, some soluble fiber in there, whether that's psyllium and I, 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 people will make all sorts of mistakes in hearing what I say. They hear fiber and they think, oh, you're a high fiber guy. And I'm like, no, I am the right amount of fiber for a person. I'm actually (laughs) constantly on my network telling people who, who get overzealous, like, right. Enough rope to hang themselves with. I'm like, you need to chill out on the fiber. Like you're going too crazy. And that's why you don't feel good. And just because it's there and you can do it doesn't mean more is better. And I've said this over and over. Like there's research showing in some people too much soluble fiber constipates them. Too much fiber in general constipates them. And everybody goes, but that's the opposite of what I thought. And I go, well, if you're constipated, maybe you should try less fiber. And then I have other people who are like, especially ex carnivores who come over and they're like, I can't tolerate beans. And I'm like, then don't eat them. This may change as you go. I, I don't do great on beans. Um, I definitely, I, I eat them maybe a couple times a week, but I don't do, they're not something that I would want to eat every day because I just don't feel great if I do them too often. I do much better on oats as an example. So I, just like I'd tell my own client, I'd be like, well, if you don't do well on beans, then try something else. If you do okay on oats, then do that. If you, you know, I have other people do the cowboy diet and it's like the most amazing thing they've ever done. So that's, that's one of the the troubles with 
when people hear a little bit of my information, they immediately go, yeah, well, he's always he's but let's pigeonhole him in that thing. I, I think meat only lean protein is impossible long term. And so I agree with that. If you are eating plants, you don't have to eat as high fat. And I always tell that to my clients that if you're not eating meat only carnivore, and you're adding a lot of different types of plants, you have to lower your fat because essentially a lot of the plants, I mean, they, the fiber, for example, they break down into short chain fatty mm -hmm. acids. So they break down into the fats that we need. I know that the conversion, I know specifically the fat is in, or in the fiber of um, flax seeds, they break down into the ALA, but then it's a horrible conversion, but still you can get some of that fat you need. But if you were just eating meat only alone and the muscle meats, um, that's where I think the trouble comes into it would when take you're not eating sufficient fat. It would take a lot of meat. Like the, one of the biggest things that I find with people, when some people go on the program or I know whether, whether it's your stuff or my stuff and they're, they're doing what they think was equivalent to like what they used to eat or how full they used to get mm -hmm. or whatever. And they end up, they're under eating. Like when they actually total up their calories, oh, yeah. they're just under eating. And they're like, why am I losing weight and so tired and da, da, da. And I'm like, have you totaled up your calories? And then they're like, I'm at like 1500 calories a day. And you're like, yeah, you're not eating enough. So whatever you're tolerating, eat more of it. Like it's, it's when people go to a whole food diet, they often, they get so satiated. Yes that they under eat. And then they're like, Oh, I don't feel good. And I'm like, this is serious. Like we need to get you to eat more of my male clients. They don't need as much fat as the women. So I can see that I can see that the, the male and female bodies are very different. The fasting windows, the fat threshold, I don't ever really require a lot of my male clients to have to eat as high fat as the women. But for women with the whole low fat popularity and stuff, I, they, sleep better and a lot of their hormones start to just balance out. And that's the, but again, we'll, we'll see in 10 years, right? So I'll be knocking but, on your door in about five years. You know, and one, of, know. one of my, one of my terms on Twitter is remember my name for, for later. <laughs> um, if it, when it doesn't work out. So it's all like, I mean, we can take out carbs and the blood sugar starts to, you know, stabilize, but does that mean the body's doing it? Or is it simply that we just, rem we bandaid removed the problem sugar. Why would we run on blood sugar if we weren't supposed to eat it or in never we were, if we were supposed to avoid sugars completely, why would our body convert proteins into sugar? If it needed, why would our body convert fats into sugar? If it's needed, why can we run on zero ketones, but we can't run on zero blood glucose. If you think about every single culture, mm -hmm. there's always some level of meat. And mm -hmm. I think when we are, so I, this is where I kind of don't follow the same suit as most um, some of the other carnivores where we're meant to be a carnivore. I think that we are meant to be omnivores because I believe that God made us in a way that the, he wants us to thrive and you get the food that's available. And sometimes there may be very limited amount of hunting. And so you have to eat some of the plants, but we have become a, such a diseased culture mm. and people of illness and diabetes is rampant. And as I've talked to some of the repeaters where they're like, it's not the sugar that's causing diabetes. And I speak with you. The, the thing is, though, that regardless of where we got the disease state, the lower carb diets, they work, um, they work, and you can consider it a band aid. And maybe over time, the goal is that people can introduce other plant based foods. I'm fine with that. But I'd rather people get to healing and an effective tool is a low carb diet because people can reduce that stress on the pancreas, uh, reduce that stress on producing insulin. And with all of that, also, it's there's also a comp component that when I speak with a lot of the doctors and naturopathic doctors is that there's a always a mental side to food. And that's my own history of addiction. So in a perfect world, I could tell all my clients just have 100 grams of carbs, because that's really what you need to sustain glucose in your brain and in your body. The thing is that a lot of people have this horrible relationship with food where oh. they've leaned on food for so long. Yes. And, and so they can't regulate the 100. So for some people, instead of just, okay, I'm going to be good and eat a certain kind of carb every, right? So maybe the beans or the rice ends up making them have like nachos with, mm. you know, the tortilla and right. all that. So it's very real, like that level of, if I just open that gateway, and hopefully as they heal, maybe they can tolerate some rice, some beans occasionally, but 
there's just some people where we have to understand their disease state and where they are. And then to then find a diet that works for them. And I know you do that because you just brought up that person that eats beef only. But that's where I think it makes sense to for certain people that meat only works because it just considers all carbohydrates non existent for their um, ill body to get to healing. And then when you talk about the glucose of if our bodies need glucose, why, why do we think that we don't need to consume it? And I mean, I, I understand that thought. And the thing is, our, our bodies also retain a lot of fat, right? So we have triglycerides, and we have, we can have fatty liver as well. But there are we store fat as well. And if we see the thing is, we will eventually our bodies will eventually run out of glucose, and then we can die. But the the safe the backing of that energy source then becomes ketone. So eventually your body will then start using the ketones or the fatty acids in your body to use energy so that you don't die and you can actually actually survive another day. And then the last thing is, even when you are using glucose, you will always be using fatty acids. It may not be ketones, but you we are always using fats as an energy source. Mm -hmm. So, but there are just so many ill people. And I was one of those people that 100 grams of carbs became 500 grams of carbs in a day, and I couldn't control myself. And you could say it's my lack of um, a motivation determination, but I was very mentally unwell. Right. And, and maybe now I could do the 100 grams, maybe now, but why not? Why change something that's not broken? And that's why right. I don't choose to do it. But yeah. I just wanted to give you my thoughts. No, I mean, people, people always like I said, the people trying to pigeonhole me, they're like, Oh, he's talking about you know, grains and beans. And they're like, he's a high carber. And I'm like, of course, no. Whereas mm -hmm. with Ray Peters, where they're drinking Mexican Cokes, I mean, geez. <laughs> and orange juice and all the fruits. I know. Adding sugar to milk. That was the most insane thing I ever heard. Do you know? Oh yeah. Some of them. I've never heard that. that. Oh yeah. I had a guy, he, he gained 30 <laughs> pounds in a month because his, um, online nutrition coaches, one of whom is obese, was telling him, oh. well, a gallon of milk a day and add sugar to it. And the guy's like, I'm, he was super lean. He was like super in shape, mid twenties, maybe late twenties, an animal. And he gained like 30 pounds in a month. And they're like, well, no, no, no. Right. This is the thing I don't get about healthcare practitioners. They're like, oh, this isn't working the way we want it. Or there's the healing pounds that the Peters talk about. I'm like, that is the biggest bunch of garbage I've ever heard. You do not need to get fat to heal. Like you may need to get back to normal weight but you don't need yeah. to get fat. They told him to go up to two gallons of milk a day instead of going, maybe this isn't working. Maybe you need less milk. They said, no, no, no. Double down the double down more yeah. milk, more sugar. That's what'll get it going. And that's when he just said, screw this. I'm gone. And <sighs> they have that in every space. Even the keto carnivore space, people will say, it's not working for you. You need well, to take in more liver right. or you need a keto carnivore harder. And that I don't agree with. There's things you can change, but to just say muscle through everything you're going and add all the organs. I mean, that was the concern. That was the biggest reason I interviewed with you and Grant, because the answer to all the reasons carnivore doesn't work was that you weren't eating enough liver. Right. And that was not the answer. And if anything, it can make a lot of people really super sick. Yes. Certain, certain carnivore gurus are reducing their liver. Of course. They're, of course. they're pulling back uh, on it because it didn't work. So anyway, or yeah. because they're probably getting enough feedback that it's hurting people and they don't want to be liable. So now they're going to reduce that intake or recommendation, which well, well, I just wanted people to know. And so you've done your part where you've allowed the carnivore community to be a little bit more hesitant. So that's great. One thing I want to ask you is about cod liver oil. We didn't touch mm -hmm. upon it a ton, but there's still some people that'll tell me, Judy, I stopped the liver. I get it. It's so bad for us, the vitamin A, but I take cod liver oil and I notice a significant difference in my health. So I, I understand your risk of vitamin A, but I just can't give up the cod liver oil. I feel good. There's some people that take it just for health, but they don't notice the difference. So they'll easily stop. But what about these people that say they feel so good on cod liver oil and then they're giving it to their children. And in reality, each spoonful is much more than like three ounces of beef liver. Weston A. Price in some of his published papers and in his, and in there's a letter from him to his nieces and nephews in nourishing traditions where he said more than one teaspoon a day in a child for an extended period could be injurious. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is I've, I have, uh, I have research showing that carotenoids 
are as addictive as nicotine cigarettes. Really? Okay. And there was a boy who was being raised by his mother on cod liver oil and butter and all these things. And then the, he was getting sick. He actually broke a bone, I think. It's an old, this is like 19, maybe 20s or something like that. And they took him off all the stuff and they actually found the kid later, like sneaking carrots and sneaking butter. And like he was, wow. it was like an addict. So when, pe when you take away an addict's drug of choice, they crave it. They have withdrawals, the very markers. There's two markers of a drug effect. Tolerance, withdrawal. Tolerance means generally people need more over time to get the same effect. People understand this with coffee, right? Where you keep drinking coffee every day and all of a sudden you get to the point where you don't feel normal if you don't have your coffee. And if you want the buzz again, you got to up your dose. That's tolerance. That's a drug effect. Then we get into withdrawal, which is simply when you take something away, you don't feel as you feel terrible. You get symptoms when you take it away. I'm going to tell you that like, as an example, like I like red meat. Is it a drug effect? No. You, if you make me eat dark meat chicken for a week, I'm not going to be happy, but I'm not going to have symptoms, right? <laughs> But if you take cod liver oil away and people are like, oh my, I feel terrible. I need, I need it. You're like, you're a junkie. Like it's, you're well, stuck. I never thought about it. that. So can you imagine oh. connecting something in food to be as addictive as cigarettes? I mean, they know that capsaicin like spicy peppers are addictive. Why? Because they stimulate adrenaline and cortisol. It's a drug effect. There's these compounds in food are not a joke, <laughs> especially plant toxins. I mean, plant toxins, they're there, right? Right, right. And so I, that's what I wanted to bring up with you with beans. Um, just as a side note is if I would assume because beans have some of the most anti-nutrients and I get it. There are some diet advocates that say beans are the thing that will allow you to remove the toxins in your body. Yes, and there was I know a lady that, that her son. Yes. Yes. So anyways, um, but the thing is that beans have a lot of phytates and lectins and they can cause gut permeability. And even if it's, let's say it's the liver that's caught or the, um, ex that bile that's causing the gut permeability. But what I would find interesting with you, and I would be so curious is your hair mineral test, because anti-nutrients are known and especially the phytates and the lectins, they're known to bind to minerals such as magnesium and zinc. I wonder if that is affecting some of your patients of increasing their mineral status, but that would be interesting. Fight, fight, I've, I've tried, I've done the research on phytates and phytic acid, and I cannot find any examples of phytates causing nu nutrient deficiency in well-nourished populations. You can only find okay, I'll it have in, to look. in like third world malnourished populations. So I haven't seen it. I, I've done a lot of research. So let me, I, I don't, I can't delineate if it was healthy or not, but I'll have to look and I'll send some to you if I do find it. If you don't eat processed food, cod liver oil is the epitome of a processed food. It is an oil extract of an organ. What am I telling you? How does the liver store toxins in itself? It binds them to fat and stores them. And then now you're grinding up that liver and taking out the fatty extract, which would concentrate the poisons. Do people get buzzes and feel things from poisons? I mean, cocaine, caffeine. Why, why might people actually, the only time that vitamin A seems to show benefit in populations is when they're starving. So they give them this drug and they see effects. Why might people have started, let's say, let's say people in indigenous populations, you know, Aboriginal populations, and they kill the animal and they go, we're going to eat the liver first because I get a buzz off that stuff. I had somebody tell me that they actually got like a buzz Same. from eating liver, right? So you've heard this. So it's like a drug. Oh, so yeah. why would we not expect people to get kind of addicted to it? Is that a good sign? Drug-like effects are never a good sign. Never. If you get a buzz from eating something, it's messing with your liver. And that's about all I have to say on that. There's a whole population of people that obviously recommend the cod liver oil with their dietary recommendations. Yep. But the other thing is, 
they believe that everyone is copper deficient. And that is where so much of the illness is. And I noticed in the hair mineral space, and honestly, this deterred me a little bit of um, being as much of an advocate about hair mineral, but (laughs) I spoke to different leaders in the space. And one group was very, everyone is deficient in copper. And then a bigger group of people was everyone's copper toxic, the copper pipes, the IUDs. And, and then I hear about seroplasmin. And, and then right now in the space, there's so many people that believe that most of us are ill because we're copper deficient. And I was just curious of your op- opinion and uh, why you think some people think that we're actually copper deficient. I don't tend to hold back on this group. I think they're charlatans. I think they're hurting people. Oh, okay. Copper is pretty much, in my opinion, a toxic metal. And the Why left... do people think they feel better then? Is it the drug effect? Yes. <laughs> copper is very okay. stimulating. This is why people who are copper okay. toxic get symptoms like anxiety and trouble falling mm. asleep initially. What so here's another example of kind of the the buzzing of copper. What do we run in our wires through our walls to conduct electricity? What's that metal that we use? Do you know? Copper wires. No. We use okay. copper wires. I thought it was only some homes, but okay. Copper wires. No, some some homes don't have copper water pipes. Okay, right, right, right. But so we're running our water through copper as well. Um Copper is very conductive. Mm. What I can say about copper and conductivity and iron and magnetism is those are the two biggest things that are, one's electromagnetic, one's electric, one's magnetic. What do we have a lot of people having problems with these days? Electromagnetic sensitivity. If you had Mm. too much copper, you'd become too conductive. And if you have too much iron, you become too magnetic. You get exposed to an electromagnetic field It's vibrating everything and you don't feel good. We see people's electromagnetic sensitivity go away all the time because I hammer down iron overload when it's there. I get rid of copper toxicity, which is stored in the liver. Basically, I'll tell you when I see vitamin A toxicity, copper toxicity is right there. They absolutely go together. So it's funny that the people are out there, there. There's a certain protocol group who love to say, yes. oh, you need, you need retinol and you need bioavailable copper. copper. And I'm like, bioavailable yes. copper is not a scientific concept. This is like the definition of pseudoscience. It is made up by an ex-hospital administrator. It's a made up concept. You want to know the paper I found on bioavailable copper, what it was, it was talking about copper that was being absorbed and causing toxicity. So when you look on PubMed, you start finding bio, I mean, the word bioavailable, let's just take the definition of the word bioavailable. It means, can you absorb it? Right. That's it. But they've turned it into copper bound to niacinamide. You can buy it in a magical supplement for hundreds of dollars. Unreal. Um, And I actually found that within the body, the body can convert copper two, which they say is very toxic, to copper one, which is what they say is the bioavailable copper. The study showed that the animals could do this conversion. There's no reason why anybody should be deficient in quote unquote fantastical bioavailable copper. This is nonsense. Why might people feel better on more copper? Because it's a stimulant. What does everybody love these days? Everybody's tired. They all want to feel more energy and stuff like that. So you can shove copper in and then people start getting, they, they just, it goes for a while. They feel okay while their liver still has storage space. Mm. And then after the liver fills up, because remember there's only going to be certain storage spaces for certain things, right? You, you, you put the things in their own little cabinets. So you run out of copper cabinets And then it's just going out into the blood. And that's when the disaster happens. And you want to know what I've heard about these groups on Facebook is when they have somebody saying, look, I'm doing the program. I'm following the protocol and I'm getting worse. Everything I try, they'll be like more cod liver oil, more copper, double down. Right. And these people are like, I'm getting worse. I'm getting worse. I'm getting worse. You want to know what these people do? These charlatans, they kick them out of the group. Oh, wow. This is the sign of people who have no idea what they're doing. They're hurting people. 
they're creating more clients for me, which I'm not totally averse to, but I don't want people to suffer to have to come to me. Right. Right. Th- this is going to explode. In, and I had, I've had people come over and they're like, this destroyed me. Whether it was the, because liver's super high in copper too. So people who are eating vitamin, it's funny, vitamin A oh, and yeah. copper. I'm saying they go together. What's, what's the liver got a bunch of? Liver, vitamin A and copper. So copper, in my opinion, like I've been hammered. People with it, don't take copper antagonists. It'll mess up your bioavailable copper and give you copper deficiency. And I, I've seen, there's really only one distinct copper deficiency sign, supposedly which is an anemia that looks almost exactly like iron deficiency anemia. Okay. I've been hammering copper antagonist minerals probably 10 years now based on testing, based on blood testing, based on hair testing. I've been taking zinc for 10 years. According to them, I should be dead. I take molybdenum based on testing. I, selenium is a copper antagonist. Why am I not having health problems from my supposed bioavailable copper deficiency? Why do I keep getting better? Why is my, my, why is my testosterone 900 as I went over in my video? Wow. If you need, there's the the charlatans out there saying you need vitamin A to make testosterone. I'm like, apparently not because I haven't been eating much of it for four years now. And I have the best testosterone level that I've ever seen on testing in my, in my life. 10 years ago. 36 years old, I'm 46 now, 10 years ago, my testosterone was 600. Mm. So now I'm 10 years older and my testosterone is 300 points higher and I've been taking zinc and now I'm like copper enemy number one. I don't think any of it's good. Um, I just went over in my video today and autistic kids, what did they find? Copper excess, way copper excess and zinc deficiency. Yep. What do they find in autism too? Lots of aldehydes, acetaldehyde, formaldehyde, retinaldehyde. They don't measure that one, but it's definitely an aldehyde that people are eating. But you can, here's the weird thing about all these toxins. People can take toxins to shut down detox, right? You wouldn't expect an alcoholic to like, if you're going to detox an alcoholic, what's the first key thing you have to do? They have to stop the alcohol. Are they going to feel better or worse? If you have a real alcoholic on your hands, like a serious alcoholic, they stop alcohol. Are they going to feel worse? Right. Of course. Yes. What can they do to feel better? They can go drink again. And they're like, oh, I'm back to normal. Thank goodness. Right. People can take toxins to feel better because by taking the toxins, you actually shut down detox because Mm -hmm. your body cannot detox and be intoxing at the same time. It won't do that because that could kill you because then you have the detox leaving you going into the blood and you have the toxins coming in, getting into the blood. And now you have twice as much. This is why I tell people like you do not really start detoxing until you stop intoxing. Mm -hmm. And then when you stop the detox or you stop the intoxing, then you start detoxing and you feel worse because now you're pushing all this garbage out. It's a a saying of mine is it's a poison on the way in and it's a poison on the way out. So we're very good at storing it. Grant actually had research showing that, like, think when they gave people an injection of retinol, it, 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 their blood retinol level only went up for like a couple seconds and then it was right back down to normal. Their liver stored the extra vitamin A in their blood so fast to get it out of the blood because free retinol is super toxic. That's why we bind it to retinol binding protein to protect us. We make a lot of binding proteins to protect us from these toxins like ceruloplasmin. We have turned these binding proteins in their little fantasy world, which I'm of the opinion that they're trying to kill us personally, but they've turned these things that are binding proteins to protect us into supposedly they're like the Uber that delivers the thing to the places it needs to go. And I'm like, nope, it's not that. If they know that if you don't make enough retinol binding protein, you get sick. Oh, you know, they're saying the, the protocol people, if you don't make enough ceruloplasmin, you get sick. 
Right. Oh, so you mean the ceruloplasmin is protecting us against the copper? And they're like, no, it makes it bioavailable. And I'm like, no, it's all toxic. It protects us from it. It's not delivering it to the tissues. It's the whole thing. Antibodies. Antibodies are binding to something to protect you from it. If you don't make enough antibodies, when you have toxins running around, you get sick. So ferritin, binding protein, like we bind, iron has so many binding proteins to protect us from it. Do we need it? Yes. But it's so toxic that we have so many binding proteins for it. So anyway, Mm -hmm. copper is generally why, why do people get better on an all muscle meat carnivore diet? That would also be a very low vitamin A diet. Right and a low copper diet and a high zinc diet. Mm -hmm. Weird coincidence, right? So, and, and when people eat a lot of plants, plant foods are where they're going to get most of their copper. I mean, meat is not a zero muscle meat is not a zero copper diet. It never was. And just like muscle meat is not a zero vitamin A diet. It never was. You don't get to get to a zero vitamin A or a zero copper diet. That doesn't happen. But I can tell you, I've had women where I'm hammering on their copper to try to get it down and I'm helping their symptoms are getting better along the way, but we're hammering on their copper. I've had women where I couldn't budge their copper down for like three or four years in the blood. Wow. There is no, this copper deficiency is nonsense. You've got copper water pipes going in your house. Every plant food you eat has copper in it. I, I've never seen right. somebody who is eating a mixed diet. If you calculate up the copper in their diet, they're never below the RDA. They're never, ever below the RDA. And the copper revolution people are talking about people trying to eat 30 milligrams of copper a day. It's insane. And they are hurting people. I didn't do much research into this copper area, but the biggest part that I was suspect about was with hair minerals, with low copper levels, their response was, yeah, see there, you don't have um, enough copper. So you need a supplement or eat the foods that are super high in copper. You want to hear a funny thing, an experiment I did early in my hair analysis. I saw the low copper on the hair test and I thought, Oh, I'm going to take copper. I saw low manganese. I'm going to take manganese. Oh, just so you know, copper in the research causes cholestasis, manganese in the research causes cholestasis. I thought I'll take one pill a day of each. Guess what happened on my next hair test, which I did monthly copper and manganese both went down. Interesting. What did I do before I learned about not being an idiot and doubling down? I thought, oh, I must be really deficient. This is showing I have a deficiency. I took an extra copper pill and an extra manganese pill. It went down again. And then I thought, this is wow. one of the things I do with people. Definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So I was like, maybe I should quit these. And then I stopped and then they came back up to where they were before. I, I had the lowest copper I've ever seen on a hair test by taking copper. I haven't seen anybody tie my low copper yet from when I was taking copper. So yeah, it absolutely doesn't work the way they, that, that's why, get this, in hair analysis, there's the people who talk about hidden copper toxicity, right? You've seen that. Where's it hiding and why does the hair test Why is it so terrible at finding it, right? They'll say, oh, all these other markers of minerals are showing the hidden copper toxins. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. If you just ran a blood test, you'd see it. It like smacks you in the face. It's so easy to find when you run a blood test. And then sometimes it'll hide on one or the other. And that's what I did. I I think I went over three people who had different patterns. Same thing happens with ferritin. The hair test is garbage for iron. You should just on a hair test, just disregard iron completely unless you see it dumping. And that's where you see it go really high and then it'll crash right back down because that was a big iron dump. But otherwise iron on a hair test is completely useless. The the biggest minerals that I found are not very easy to use on hair testing are the minerals with the most binding proteins. Mm. Oh, like copper and like iron things that I don't use a lot from the hair test. So basically my view on copper with the hair test is blood is first. Blood is primary for zinc and copper. You layer the hair test, zinc and copper with it, but you always go by the blood as your primary and the hair test is secondary. So what was funny is that that group of people, when the marker was low, they would say, yeah, you're copper deficient. So therefore you need 
all the things that they talk about. But then when it's high, then they have another thing they'd say, they say, yeah, well, you don't have the bioavailable version of copper. Right. And that was the part that I thought, well, that's just odd. So it doesn't matter which way your copper is, no matter what, you're deficient. And that to me was the biggest suspect of, I don't know about this. I mean, it's such a, it's a known toxic metal. And the fact that it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter whether it's high or low on the hair mineral. They and I, granted, I mean they're not doing the blood test, but they're saying regardless, right. you are um, you need copper, and that to me was so. Basically, anyone that ever does the hair test will always need copper based on their definition, and that was the biggest suspect for me. Yeah, that's the sign of a fraud. Absolutely. <laughs> One of the arguments that people will say, like about the anti nutrients in plants, lots of people will be like, oh, there's these anti nutrients in plants, and this is a big deal, and this is a big deal. And then they'll go, oh, but nature, God, whatever they want to believe, put vitamin A in plants for a reason. And I go, wait, where did the logic from the anti nutrients go? Why did that all of a sudden disappear? And then the, the, when people talk about vitamin A in animals, they got it from plants. Animals don't make vitamin A. Right. They eat carotenoids and they convert it for you. And then one of these groups is saying, well, like a Western price group was saying that, oh, we're not good at converting it. So we obviously need to eat animals. So we're somehow poorly designed and we have to eat cod liver oil or eat liver to get enough vitamin A. And I'm just like, this is the biggest like victim mentality, nonsense it makes no sense. Carotenoids are not essential for anything in the body. And this has been said over and over. Oh, high carotenoids in the blood is common with diabetes. Did you know that? Carotenemia and diabetes. Hypothyroidism and carotenoids in the blood. Absolutely, totally connected. But then the papers will say, this is obviously not from the carotenoids. They keep finding high carotenoids with these conditions but the carotenoids are obviously not connected to this health condition. It's lunacy. It's straight up lying in my opinion. So, mm -hmm. but there's no carotene, there's no vitamin A, animal vitamin A without plant vitamin A. And if plant vitamin A is not essential to any animal, which it's not, how can retinol, which comes from it, be essential to animals? You're taking a terpenoid and you're turning it into an alcohol. Do we actually think that alcohols are essential to life? Retinol. How long should you be settling in for? Because I tell people it's a marathon, not a sprint. We're getting out decades worth of poisons from your liver and we can't just do it all at once because like I said, poison on the way in, poison on the way out. You push this thing too hard. You're going to, you're going to blow up. You're just going to, you're going to feel like garbage. And I tell people, if you're feeling like garbage, you're pushing too hard and you need to back off. So I tell them three years in terms of like, usually by the end of six months, they're going to know that this is the right path, that they're doing okay. the right thing. As, assuming they're paying attention to their body, but we can see improvements all along the way. But I tell people like, if, if you're going to do this and you want to plan to get everything gone, three years. Yeah, I had a client that did blood work and the vitamin A was normal and then did it, went on a low vitamin A protocol. Mm -hmm. And then I think a couple months later, the vitamin A was high. Yeah. It was, so was, I saw it with my own eyes. I have yeah. to see this study. Grant told me that there was a study in, in an Asian country where they took these kids, they kind of, I don't know what they did, but they removed the vitamin A from their diet. Yes. And they saw overall average, they saw the vitamin A go up. Right. Right. And I think it was it, sweet this, potatoes. It, it was might, sweet potatoes. It might be. I, I just, I hadn't, I have that one case study. I have my experience with people. I tell people like your vitamin A, people want it to be like a linear thing. They want it to just go down. And I'm like, nope, that's yes. not how it works. What the research says is most people actually stay at a plateau for years, mm -hmm. several years. And then it starts dropping like a rock. Some people go up a little bit at the start and then they come down and then they plateau. And some people just kind of slowly go down over time. Those are the three most common patterns. Interesting. So I just tell them, I, I don't care about your vitamin A level on the blood test. As long as you're doing the process and you're feeling better, I don't have to have a vitamin A test on people. I run a vitamin A test on people because I'm the vitamin A guy. I don't have to have a vitamin A number to get people better by having them avoid this toxin. You mentioned one guy that all of a sudden after reducing vitamin A, 
that his testosterone got better, you know, that he was able to hang out with his wife more. It's yeah. interesting because I didn't realize there was a connection, but there are people in our space that one of the reasons they moved over from a meat only nose to tail carnivore diet is because they said their testosterone tanked. But these same people ate beef liver every single day and probably still do. So what's the correlation between testosterone or sex hormones and this vitamin A? Vitamin A is, it actually stimulates aromatase. Oh, okay. Which converts more of the testosterone to estrogen. I have studies like, let's say on Spanish men where they showed that basically when they were looking at sperm and FSH and stuff like this, fertility stuff. Mm -hmm. And they found that the men who identified as eating the most organ meats had the lowest sperm motility. Wow. <laughs> I've got studies showing that retinoic acid destroys the Sertoli cells, that it damages the Leydig cells. Like it's just total, basically those, for those of you who don't know, those are the sperm producing cells. I don't know. I don't remember okay. which one I said first. They're one of them's the sperm producing cells. One of them's the testosterone producing cells of the testes in men. I can tell you when I get, when I get women who have any kind of hormonal problems, there's always copper toxicity and there's usually vitamin A toxicity with it. Um, copper is hell on your reproductive organs. It's, but anyway, yeah, vitamin A is nasty two things. And, but the thing is, there's a thing I call the duration paradox, which is where kind of like caffeine, right? Somebody starts a caffeine habit. They've, they didn't drink coffee before they start drinking coffee and they're like, this is amazing. This is the best thing ever. And they have all this energy. And so that's the, this is the start of the duration paradox. They do something short term and they see improvements. So they have this short term benefit and then long term, what does caffeine do to somebody's energy long term? It ruins it. Then they have to drink to have any energy. So it's, it's that this short term benefit, long term destruction of the very thing it seemed to help. Fixing the vitamin A and copper problem is going to dis utterly destroy industries in this country. It's going to hurt them so badly financially that nobody's going to, they're going to, some people are going to be like, well, we can't do this. It'll kill the industry. And you're like, yeah, but you can kill yourself or you can kill your children. But you know, the, the studies on infertility and miscarriage and all that stuff on vitamin A, why do you think Bill Gates is trying to make golden rice, which makes vitamin A? He's trying to make a non-sweet banana to sell in Africa that produces vitamin A the Gates Foundation had an article complaining that during CUFID that they weren't able to get vitamin A to all the people that needed it because they couldn't do their little missions or whatever you want to call it. Bill Gates is a big supporter of birth control. Oral contraceptives yeah. have been shown to raise copper and raise vitamin A in the blood since 1975, over and over and over again. Why is there a copper IUD? Putting a copper wire in your cervix, making you infertile. This should explain something, the connection between them. We see oral contraceptives raise copper and vitamin A in the blood. Or you can put a copper wire there. Or you can put a wire that has hormones in it. Right that have been shown to raise vitamin A and copper in the blood. So we can pretty much go, if you want to induce infertility, just raise your vitamin A and copper. There you go. Most of our community knows that Bill Gates is trying to buy up all the land and it's mm. either that he's buying all the land for the plant-based foods or that he's trying to take away all the land so that there's less animals that we can consume. But either way, it's just interesting that you're right. I knew about the golden rice. I never thought about vitamin A or the copper. And then we think about copper IUD and it's true that that can cause toxicity. And, and then when we think about that, of course that causes infertility because it's intentional, but then we think that copper helps with so many other things. So when you put it out that way, it's so obvious. I mean, there's a lot of people that are jumping onto this bioavailable copper. We need it. I know the Ray Peak community does it. That other protocol we were talking about does it. And they are all, and people are saying they feel better. They feel that they can get pregnant again. And it's just ironic because it's the complete opposite of what we're talking about. You can yes. never deny oh, placebo. If people just yes, want absolutely. to get better enough, they could do all sorts of things that 
make them feel better. Then there's that duration paradox where they do something and they, yeah. they actually shut down detox, which, so the detox was what was making them feel bad, but then they take more of the poison, their body shuts down detox and then they feel better. This is, this is the problem. This is the confusing thing is you can shut down detox and feel better. Or if you're detoxing too fast, you can feel worse. And so people are doing the right thing, but they feel worse. It's very complicated. And this is, this is it's why a lot mess. of my work is not for everybody because not everybody can wrap their head around it. But once they get it, they go, oh, this is what they go. They start to look back in their life and they go, oh, this is why I felt better doing that for a while. I, a honeymoon phase. There's often honeymoon phases with mm -hmm. these things. This is the Ray P thing. I remember, I remember going on Ray P forum and one guy was like, where's all the, the, the success stories on here? All right. I see is people complaining of they need more thyroid or they're going to do methylene blue, which is a drug. Oh my God. If there was ever a drug, um, there, he was like, where's all these people with all these amazing testimonials? Shouldn't everybody be doing amazing? And you know what, you know what happened? He got attacked by everybody. This is not legit practitioners who actually care about their people. And nobody out there is talking about how to fix it. Yes. What about lactoferrin? lactoferrin? So lactoferrin, uh, I'll just try to give the quick overview. Lactoferrin is a, sure. is a protein. Most people associate it with, um, it's found in breast milk. It's found in every right. single fluid in the human body, tears, mm -hmm. you know, saliva, blood. It's in every single fluid in the human body. Most people know about it in terms of breast milk. Now babies right. at the peak of nursing can get up to, I think, I think the calculation I came to based on, you know, average breast milk production and the amount of lactoferrin that's in it, they can get up to a gram, a thousand milligrams of lactoferrin a day. That's a lot. Like the pills I make are 400 milligrams each. So, well, considering lactoferrin in, 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 in the, in the research, I've found research that shows that it helps with bile production and excretion. Mm -hmm. It helps to improve the speed of your ADH alcohol dehydrogenase and ALDH aldehyde dehydrogenase. And one of the bigger things is in some of the research, the um, cholangiocytes, there's a paper that shows that lactoferrin increases the production of cholangiocytes, the bile duct cells. Okay. And then we have uh, showing that lactoferrin can help repair the, the intestinal lining. So being that as adults, well, well, actually I, sorry, lactoferrin tends to be made the most in epithelial cells, right? Which are the cells that the outer cells of things, whether it's the outside of your liver, the outside of each part of your liver or the outside of your, um, your, I mean, your skin is epithelial tissue, your gut lining is epithelial skin. tissue. Just think of anything that lines. Like if you think of, for a lot of people, if you think of fascia, that would be kind of like a way mm -hmm. you could think of the epithelial, like it's covering everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Epithelial cells make lactoferrin. Mm -hmm. I have research showing that vitamin A destroys epithelial cells. So you would then make less epithelial cells and you would make less lactoferrin. Now, another, another cell that, um, makes lactoferrin in your body is neutrophils. And I have research showing that vitamin A toxicity will reduce your neutrophils. It will cause neutropenia. So we have research showing that vitamin A will directly basically reduce your lactoferrin production. Funny that vitamin A also causes cholestasis, which is the leakiness of the bile pathway, because if you can't repair it, it just breaks down. So what do we do to get, what can lactoferrin then help with? It can help with fixing this whole problem. Um, the problem is, is most people aren't too interested in getting human breast milk lactoferrin and it's kind of hard to get. Mm. So we use bovine or cow lactoferrin. Okay. The stuff we get is fr from French cows and it's not, um, it's spray dried. So it's not heated. Most lactoferrin on the market is a byproduct of cheese making. So they get the whey mm. from cheese making and then they turn it into lactoferrin. Tends to be very denatured, which means it doesn't do quite the job that it's supposed to. Ours is like 95% right. denatured because it's spray dried and not heat, heat dried and made from, you know, byproducts. Anyway, so 
lactoferrin is something, an adjunct, if you will, an added thing mm -hmm. that can help speed along the process. Oh, like on the note about testosterone and estrogen, there is a, there's a paper out there that shows that lactoferrin increased the testosterone to estrogen ratio, um, in humans by like 3.6 times. Wow. So a lot less estrogen and a lot more, um, lactoferrin. I mean, sorry, a lot more testosterone. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting molecule and I, I got into it the research all made sense to me. And so I decided that was my first product that we came out with and it really helps when people use it right. So let's talk about using it right. Cause I remember in the questions you sent me, they were talking about some people don't feel anything from it. Some people have a really rough reaction to it. Right. Why is that? Well, the pe I'm going to tell you the people who have a really rough reaction to it are likely really cholestatic. Don't jump in and you're one of the sensitive ones and mess yourself up. I take my job very seriously. And I, sure. who, who tells you to start on less than one pill? I mean, that's not normal. It's I don't a bad do business model. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, this is super powerful. You, you, I mean, you could poison yourself with bile. So, so go slow. Sure. And so some people are like, well, I took a lot of it or my husband was able to take one pill or two pills within like a month. And I'm stuck on like less than a drop a day of the lactoferrin. Cause we, we use a drop. It's like one sixty fourth of a teaspoon. That's the smallest measuring spoon you can get. Oh, okay. Um, and they're like, I can't, I can hardly take it. And I go, okay, well then you take what you tolerate and then you just go from there over time. It should get better. And some people say they don't feel much from it. Well, fixing the bile pathways is not something that happens overnight. So it may take months, years, but what people who keep taking it and notice over time that they're like, oh, wait, my energy's better. My pooping's better. And that's the one thing. I mean, I do, I do one pill twice a day. That's all I tell people like the max to take. It seems that over a thousand milligrams is just diminishing returns. It doesn't give a lot of benefit and it's not, it's not a cheap supplement. Let me just, one other example, maybe you've heard about camel milk as being like helpful oh, with right, autism right. and stuff yes. like that, right? Do you know that camel milk has the highest amount of lactoferrin of any mammal milk? Mm -hmm. And it's the most similar. It's like 90% similar to human lactoferrin. Interesting. What if the whole camel milk fad is simply a lactoferrin fad? I don't tell people they have to take it. It's just something beneficial that I believe can help move them along faster. So yeah. Where can people find you, your Twitter account, the videos that you talked about? So on most things on, on the, on the internet, social media, if you're look if you look for me under nutrition detective, that's how you're okay. generally going to find me on Twitter. It's nutri detect. Cause I can't fit the whole thing in there. So yes. my website is nutritiondetective.com. You could probably guess that. Um, I can send you a link tree which has all my, okay, all my links perfect. on it. The basic love your liver program is at members.nutritiondetective.com. Um, I will put everything in the show notes. Thank you again for joining me today. I mean, I know that we don't always agree perfectly yeah. on the diet, but I think we are both flexible. And I think that's our mission is really to help people. And essentially the overarching goal that I think you and I both agree on is that maybe we need to cut down some of the vitamin A, especially beyond the RDA levels. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes People need different levers of macros and ways of eating to find healing, but you have to always find what makes sense for you. I do have some clients that whether they did a different protocol with a different doctor that they've added a little bit of psyllium husk for fiber, and it just helps them feel like they're going more often. But I personally do not think that you need it or it's required. Everyone will be different. I work really well on a high fat diet and my bowels are consistent as I always advocate for them. Just know that if you are consuming a lot of liver or you are supplementing with a lot of copper and copper is also very, very high in beef liver, not as much in chicken liver, but it is high still in both. But you want to just consider these things as you are on your health journey to finding wellness, because essentially all of the people that I interview, whether they have differing opinions, the goal is that we are trying to find levers for you to get to root cause healing. And for every single person, that lever is going to be different. You have to find what makes sense for you. And I hope that all of these interviews, not to overwhelm, not to make you go down so many different rabbit holes, but it's to find if 
all of these other levers haven't worked, that maybe this is the lever that may be the right answer for you. Make sure to eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys later. Bye guys.